This time on Mega Shippers. In Shoreham on England's south coast, thousands of tons of wood chip biomass creates a cloud of hazardous dust. And supervisor Robin Merry must bring it under control. We can't afford to let any of this get into the open air. We've got too many local residents and too many people in this area. In Kings Lynn, Norfolk, project manager Dan Otika tries to unload a brand new 40 million pound generator without damaging the ship or the dock workers. I wouldn't stand there, mate. And in the Orkney Isles, north of Scotland, freight manager Chris Bevan must load almost 700 cattle in just 10 hours. Agriculture's the biggest industry in Orkney, and without this service, then the, the sector just wouldn't survive. Across the world, there's a hidden army of workers who keep the world's cargo moving 365 days a year. Whether it's high value, if there's any damage, my neck's on the line. Or high volume. One miscalculation. No, 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 no. I've got 10 metres to go ahead. One change in conditions. The start to completely fell down. Could spell disaster. Mother Nature stamped her feet. With reputations and lives on the line. Yeah. They'll do whatever it takes to ensure the cargo gets delivered on time and in perfect condition. These are the Mega Shippers. Shore and Port, East Sussex, on the English Channel. Handling two million tonnes of cargo a year, from food to building materials. Dockside, over 5,000 tonnes of wood chips, known as biomass, ready to be shipped to power stations in Sweden, where it will be burnt to make electricity. Old wood is now sourced from demolition sites and recycling centres and made into new fuel, rather than being burnt on location or sent to landfill. An increasingly significant bulk material for Shore and Port and Dockside Supervisor Robin Merry. Today we're loading biomass, which is a chip wood product. Uh, basically it's all from the old building industry. It's had all the pieces of metal and all the plastic stripped out of it. So basically left with the, now the raw wood. It looks like a pile of old rubbish to, to everyday me and you, doesn't it? But again, this cargo, in the old days, again, would have been landfilled. Just would have been a dead cargo. But now it's worth good money. Two miles offshore, waiting to be loaded with the biomass, is the bulk cargo vessel Camellia. 95 metres long, and able to carry up to 5,000 tonnes of cargo. But to get the Camellia to the biomass loading area, navigation pilot Paul Chalmers must get on board. He needs to help the captain of the Maltese registered ship navigate the approach to port and the sharp right-hand turn into the narrow lock at Shoreham. Uh, today we've got the Camellia coming in. She's a, a 3,000 gross ton bulker. She's just come round from Ipswich. Uh, we'll go out and board her shortly and uh, bring her in. We're going to bring the ship in through the entrance, which is 110 metres wide, bring it round the corner, which is a very sharp turn, more or less a right angle turn. Then we've got to come up here to the lock. So what I've got to do is make sure that the ship is coming in at an angle and we don't bang anything, don't catch anything, don't do any damage to our lock or the uh, ship itself. Shore and port is tidal, with the water level rising from two to five metres. The lock keeps the water in the inner basin at a constant height, so ships always remain level for loading. Uh, the lock is 106 metres long and 17.4 metres wide. The ship is 96 metres long and 16 metres wide. So we've only got 10 metres clearance in length and uh, a metres clearance, metre point four clearance in beam. So it means we've got to be fairly precise in control of the ship. I've never been on this ship before. This ship's never been into this port before. I don't know how the company maintains its vessels. Anything can happen. It's like parking a car with no brake. And all you've got is the reverse. If you have to put your car into reverse to stop it, that's what you're doing with the ship. The Camellia is on a tight schedule. It has to be back in Sodatage in Sweden in 48 hours. 
Navigation pilot Paul needs to get on board to help guide her into Shoreham. Come in, Wayne. Yes, sir, we'll be with you in approximately 20 minutes' time. If we can have a pilot ladder, please, on the starboard side, one and a half metres above the water. The pilot launch is uniquely designed to meet big ships, with a black rubber fender ready to pull alongside the Camellia so Paul can board and get a berth next to the biomass loading area. Um, she's pretty big for this port, sort of uh, two thirds of our absolute maximum. It's very, very tidal. There's a very strong tidal flow across the entrance and in this area we're in at the moment. So you've got to allow for that. A lot of sideways movement and lateral movement once you get through the pier heads. And the, the, the other factor with this port is there's nowhere else to go. You can't sort of come racing in and you've got a big river to go up. We're straight into the lock as soon as we get in and around the corner. It's going to be a tough manoeuvre. It's the first time Paul has taken charge of the Camellia and he still needs to jump from one boat to another to get on board. We take a good look at things before we, we, we make that final step from the, uh, from the boat to the ladder. So if the, the conditions are really, really rough, we don't do it because it is just too dangerous. In the middle of England's east coast, the port of Kings Lynn, Norfolk. In the 13th century, one of England's most important ports. In 1997, a natural gas power station was opened, but after just 15 years, it was mothballed in 2012. Old machinery and high gas prices made it too costly to run. But an important shipment is about to help breathe new life into the old power station. A 315-tonne gas turbine worth nearly £40 million, made by the German engineering firm Siemens. Overnight, the generator has arrived from Hamburg aboard the Eastern Vanquish, an 89-metre-long, 12-metre-wide general cargo ship. The gas turbine is the sole cargo on board. It's an important landmark for the head of electricity generation at Kings Lynn Power Station, Adam Kennard. Uh, yes, it's taken us somewhere in the region of six years to plan this and we're extremely excited to see it arrive today. Uh, it's been a long time in the planning and uh, finally come to fruition here. The generator makes electricity by mixing and igniting air and natural gas. The gas turbine is the, the prime mover in a, in a modern power plant. The gas turbine itself is the primary source of power. Uh, it connects to a generator directly and provides about 300 megawatts of that power. This exhaust is fed through to a large boiler which creates steam, which then goes into a steam turbine and adds to the power feed from there. Uh, this particular power turbine, when it's configured in the combined cycle plant we have, will power 370,000 homes in this area. The man responsible for moving the £40 million generator without any damage, 28-year-old project manager Garno Tika. Today, we're here to oversee the lifting operation, uh, so getting it off the vessel. It's a big lift, uh, so there's a lot involved. It's a massive project for us. Lifting the gas turbine out of the hold will be a mobile crane with a reach of 136 metres and the ability to lift 750 tonnes. It's already been set up quayside, but the team want a decision on whether the 315-tonne turbine will be landed on the left or right-hand side of the crane. Garno needs to call the engineering team in the office. Hi, Matt. We seem to have a bit of um, an issue in terms of where the crane is positioned. So, on the drawings, we've got a slewing on the right hand side and then getting the trailer next to the crane. What it looks like on the right hand side, there's not enough space there to slew on the right hand side. There is, there is a left hand side where there's, uh, there's, it looks like there's enough space there where they can slew left. Showing you where you're loading it on your trailer. Yeah. You haven't got it, you haven't got it uh, positioned for there or there. Whether they land the generator left or right of the crane, they must leave enough room for the 95 metre long trailer that'll take it to the power station. That's actually, uh, that's where I've marked out. I've marked so that's, where the ends. that's where the trail will be ending up. If you, if you if it... temporarily put it at the front, yeah. the centre of the trail is going to be on that, that way across there. 
With just six hours of daylight left, Garno must make a decision. Well, the plan is to, to end it up here, but obviously that's not what it's been, uh, it's been drawn up, um, already engineered. Right, so we got, we, well, we've got a slew um, left now, are we? Yeah. Right. With the decision made to land the turbine on the left of the crane, the crew must prepare the steel landing mats to spread the weight of the 315-ton turbine before it's loaded into the cradle. Yeah, so we're committed now, because obviously we're trying to uh, gain time now on the whole job. So uh, once all the mats are set, we, the crane's going to lift it off the vessel and then place uh, the gas turbine onto uh, the set of mats. But under Garno's plan, when the crane swings round to the left carrying the turbine, the ship's 18-metre-high bridge and gantry will be in the way. It looks like they'll now have to move the ship, and the change of plan needs to be approved. The ship has to move forward 9 metres um, to get in line with where the crane is. Halfway through the lift, the ship will have to pull backwards, otherwise the team will be risking catastrophic damage to the 40 million pound gas turbine and the ship. You've got the gantry of the, sh of the ship there, so the idea is to move um, the ship roughly 9 or 10 metres uh, back. It's a huge test for Garno, in the biggest project of his career. It's the most expensive item he's ever moved, and the power station in King's Lynn is relying on him to safely deliver the generator, which will bring the power plant online after six years of planning. Shore and Port on the English Channel. 2,000 tonnes of wood chip biomass fuel is waiting to be loaded onto the cargo ship Camellia and delivered to a power station in Sweden. But first, navigation pilot Paul Chalmers has to guide the bulk cargo vessel into the harbour. Yes, sir, we've just left the port and we're on our way to you now. If you'd like to keep closing towards the port, please, sir, maintain a speed of about six knots for boarding. With the Camellia and the pilot launch, both headed towards port at six miles an hour, Paul pulls alongside, and as a seasoned expert, swiftly climbs aboard. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Paul's first priority is to contact the lockmaster at Shoreham, Dave Smith, so he can prepare the lock for the Camellia's arrival. Two miles off now, uh, six metres, uh, anchor's clear, no defects. Yeah, they're all copied, sir. Yeah, 6.1 metres are on the gauge, sir. If I could have the steering, please. So the pilot's boarded the vessel. Uh, he's confirmed he's on board. Uh, the ship is safe to actually be able to make its approach to the port. Like every other ship across the globe, the Camellia broadcasts its global position through very high frequency radio waves. Any other ship in the vessel tracking network can pick them up in the Automated Identification System, or AIS. See, up here I can see we have our AIS and radar system, which gives me a good in indication of all vessels that are in the area, and also their speed. There's our boat there, that's the Camellia. She's on the way in. As you can see, at the moment, her direction of travel is that way, but the entrance to the port is there and it looks as if it's going to be hitting the land. With the wind and tidal surge pushing the Camellia offshore, they need to carefully adjust the power of the engines to enter Shoreham safely. Ready to turn hard to the right and slow down to enter the lock. Shoreham, Camellia. Yeah, just to confirm we have uh, 6.2 on the gauge uh, now, Paul. Two inches coming through the entrance now. Aye, aye. The gates are open, and she approaches at just two miles an hour. Cap, because it's sunny. The lock is just 17 metres wide. The Camellia is nearly 14 metres from port to starboard. One wrong move negotiating the narrowest stretch of the harbour could cause catastrophic damage to both the ship and the lock. 
there's just a 150 centimeter gap between her steel hull and the concrete wall. The port of Kings Lynn, Norfolk. The Eastern Vanquish is Quayside, carrying a 315 ton electricity generator destined for a brand new combined gas power station in nearby Kings Lynn. It'll be built on the same site as the old mothballed facility and produce 1700 megawatts of power, more than five times the output of the 1990s power plant. Now I'm just going to shadow uh, from the top, yeah. Project manager Garno Tika and the team must get the gas turbine out of the hold and onto the quayside before it gets dark. But it's already half past two and he has to make sure the ship moves out of the way once the lift has started. So once, you, once it's lifted, you guys move this way and, and then obviously the, crew, the crane will slew yeah. this way, yeah? yeah? The mobile crane rotates on a central circular axis known as slewing. The crane's fixed boom length means the ship has to move backwards or the turbine could crash into the gantry in front of the bridge. We've got to move the ship because of, uh, you've got the overhead uh, gantry there of the ship, so obviously that'd be the way where you'd be slewing to, to, to the left. Two steel rope slings are attached to four points on the frame that protects the gas turbine. And at three o'clock in the afternoon, the lift can finally get going, but not before some of the team are repositioned. I wouldn't stand there, mate. He's going to get the tag, he's going to grab the tag line. Have you got no one to do it? Huh? Have you got no one else to do it? Well, I've got him on one on the floor and the other lad's in the ship. Right. Keep hoisting, mate, and you can start nudging to your left steady. With the generator now off the floor of the hold, the Eastern Vanquish can motor back 10 metres. The crane now has room to swing round and land all 315 tonnes on the quayside without hitting the ship. Keep it going, Link. And bring your slew to a steady stop there, mate. Just hoist down for a minute, hoisting down only. Hoisting down only, mate. Keep coming down. We've got to position these stands before you can land it, mate. The team on the ground are manning guide ropes to ensure the 315 ton generator hits its landing position at the correct angle. And then we can move it to where it needs to be. Can you go over onto that one? Because I'm going to need to put John on the tray in a minute. Lift supervisor Tony Wilson needs to carefully land the 40 million pound turbine on four independent steel platforms known as drum stands. Hoisting down steady, mate. Keep coming, Lee. Keep coming down. Keep coming down, keep coming down, and hold that, hold that, and bring that to a stop there, mate. Just have to wait now, they've got a German to confirm where it's got to go. An engineer from the manufacturer Siemens, Wacken Gusto, needs to make sure the gas turbine has been unloaded in perfect condition and will be safely positioned where it will be stored overnight. And then put timber. Wood. Yes, I do. I need to see what he decides anyway. Although the team is satisfied with its location, Joachim thinks that without more stability, the 40 million pound turbine might fall off. Garno must break the news to the office. He's got a concern that uh, if, if, he leave, if, if we leave the drum stands there, the, the piece might tip over. It's a major test of Garno's ability to adapt the plans to suit the client. And I uh, just need to make some more alterations to how it's sat now. Uh, yes, it means get the, drum, get the drum stands um, out and then lower it down again onto the mats. But yeah, we'll get there, we'll get there. Well, pick, pick it up, yeah. There's just an hour left of daylight and it's a change of plan that involves lifting the crane back up in the air so the drum stands can be discarded and the gas turbine lowered back down onto the new flatter setup. Hoisting down, mate. Hoisting down. 
front end's landed. We'll reconvene tomorrow and then start the work and uh, lift it onto our trailer. Day two, and the 95 metre long trailer arrives Quayside to take the generator four miles by road to the power station. A 48 tonne Trojan truck will pull a 200 tonne trailer. The gas turbine will sit in a central cradle between two 14 axle hydraulic platform modular trailers. It's 95 metres long and five metres wide. Although it's been planned months in advance, they need to double check the dimensions of the steel framework surrounding the gas turbine. Yeah. And on closer inspection, there's a problem. It was never going to go in. The whole unit is 30 centimetres wider than they expected, and the cradle on the trailer is too small. It's a major setback for Garner. We just um, realised there's, there's a bit of a discrepancy in terms of information we've drawn up and also what we currently have on site. So there's a bit of a rejigger to do in terms of the trailer. Obviously that delays things by um, two or three hours, but we're still hopefully going to be loaded in today. The whole transport cradle must be taken apart to make it bigger. It's put the operation back another three hours. Is that threaded, that one, or not? If they can't fix it, there'll be no lift today. The generator will be stuck quayside, and the power station in Kings Lynn will be facing more delays. Shoreham Port, Sussex, on England's south coast. The Camellia, a 96-metre-long bulk carrier is squeezing through the port's lock on a way to pick up 2,000 tonnes of wood chip biomass fuel for an electricity power station in Sweden. Lockmaster Dave Smith must make sure she gets safely through. When you're up there, looking at the size of this coming into that lock, it can be a little bit deceiving. It does fit, honestly. The camellia is almost 14 metres wide, leaving just 150 centimetres each side. She enters the lock at just two miles an hour. The team dockside are ready to hold her in place with mooring ropes whenever she stops. The lock gates are here in front of you there, and I've obviously got to make sure that she's in, in steady and slowly. Camellia Shoreham, you've got 10 metres, Paul. 10 metres, thanks Dave. So we've got 10 metres to clear the lock gates at the moment. Up on the bridge, navigation pilot Paul Chalmers must use all his local knowledge to park the 3,000 tonne ship inside the lock using reverse thrust. So you know, at the moment they're using, they've got the uh, brake rope at the front on the spring and they're still pulling in the stern light moment to get it clear of the gates. Once she's clear, I can give him the pilot the indication. You're inside and clear, sir. Inside and clear, thanks. The lock holds three million cubic gallons of water, and with the camellia in place, they shut the gates. But they need to add another 750,000 gallons to bring a level with the inner canal so she can be loaded. Right, what's happening now is I've opened the sluices at the east end of the lock. Water is now coming from the canal into the lock bringing the camellia level, water level up. Once she's level with the level in the canal, we can open the gates and she can go off to her berth. 30 minutes after she entered the lock, the water's level with the inner basin. She's clear to head for a berth where she'll be loaded with the biomass. But in the inner basin, there's limited room for maneuver. And it's a challenge for navigation pilot Paul Chalmers to get round the other vessels on the quayside. Drop it on now. It's closer than he'd like. But get me a stern line as soon as you can. I've got 10 metres to go ahead. I need a stern line, quickly, please. The ship isn't responding as quickly as he'd like, and he has to think on his feet. Yeah, drop the spring on. 
Finally, he gets her alongside, but not exactly a textbook berthing. It was a little bit tricky. Uh, the ship, when it was supposed to be in neutral, wasn't in neutral. It was tickling ahead all the time. And uh, every time I put any power on, she shot ahead. And I would try to berth her a right-handed ship left-handed, and uh, that ship there, I just, just cut in behind there, and I got sucked in as I came in. We nearly clipped it. Uh, it was quite interesting. The camellias safely berthed, but the dockside team have got just 24 hours to get 2,000 tonnes of biomass loaded before she has to leave for Skodatage, and the Swedish power station is relying on the delivery. The Orkneys a group of 70 islands 10 miles off the northeast coast of Scotland. At the heart of the island's economy is agriculture. A vital lifeline is the freight ferry that transports live animals between Kirkwall, Orkney's biggest town, and the Scottish mainland. Freight manager Chris Bevan is preparing to transport up to 700 cattle to Aberdeen on board the Hildesay roll-on, roll-off cargo ferry. We ship these seven or eight hundred live animals out um, on a weekly basis down to get uh, fattened up on the Scottish mainland or onward to the abattoir to go into the food chain. We've been shipping live animals off the islands for generations, if not hundreds of years, um, but not in such volume um, as it is today. Without this service, the sector just wouldn't survive. Twelve miles east of the port in Kirkwall are the rich pastures of DNS. For 16 years, Keith Yunsen has been rearing the much sought after continental breed, Limousine Cross Belgian Blue. Because they're large animals, the only way the cattle can get to the Scottish mainland as a live export is by sea. This ferry service is a lifeline service. So the majority of the cattle that's bred in Orkney will go down to the mainland of Scotland for fattening. So it's better to take the cattle to where the grain is. Keith makes more profit selling his one-year-old cattle to farmers on the mainland than he would if he fattened them up on Orkney with expensive imported grain. But before he can ship them, he has to sell them at auction. Taking 15 to market tomorrow, it tends the use and five heifers. I would like to probably get 1,100 to 1,200 pounds for this one-year-old steers at market tomorrow. We'll just to wait and see. Hopefully we'll get them sold. Don't have to take any of them home again. Of the 50,000 beef cattle on the islands, every year half of them are exported live to be fattened up by other farmers on the Scottish mainland. The cattle here, we're taking them in to load them in the trailer to put them into the mart. Keith must sell all 15 young cattle to keep his farm going. The Hildesay roll-on, roll-off ferry is dockside in Kirkwall. Chris Bevan is preparing specially built livestock containers to make sure the cattle have enough food and water for the seven hour journey to Aberdeen. We've got hay in the racks here for uh, feeding them during the voyage. Do you can see that they've got uh, what we call nipple drinkers here, and those are the ones that connect up to the, the ship's water supply to ensure they get fresh water during the voyage. So this is very much first class travel for animals. If you can fit 35 in each vessel, you're talking you know, between eight, 900 uh, cattle per, per, per sailing. The Hildesay Ferry is scheduled to leave at 8 p.m. But if Keith's to get his cattle on board, he needs to sell them at the auction house in Kirkwall. Buyers from the Scottish mainland have arrived on Orkney and are eager to get their hands on the breed. Oh, look at that. There's a nice heifer. Stand on. 230. Bay. 230. Bay. 23. 4. That's 25. That's 31. That's 32. That's 53. That's 54. That's number 5. 605. Right. Oh, here we go. Keith's livestock must sell today. If they don't, not only will his farming business be under pressure, but the cattle won't be going on the ferry. £1,000 to go. The port of Kings Lynn, Norfolk, on the east coast of England. A 315 tonne electricity generator needs to be lifted onto a 5 metre wide metal cradle 
so it can be taken by road to the power station under construction nearby. It's the key piece of machinery at the heart of the facility, which will reopen in 2019. But even after months of planning, the cradle is too narrow by 30 centimetres. The team from ALE need to make it wider by adding length to the cross beams. It's already one o'clock on the second day of the operation and the generator should already have been inside the cradle. There's obviously been a discrepancy in terms of uh, the measurements we've uh, received on the drawing and um, what we've set the trailer today. So it looks like we'll have to um, widen the trailer. Uh, we're talking about uh, 300 to 400 mil, um, which is obviously it's, uh, it's quite a, a massive difference. Quite good that we find out quite early. By four o'clock in the afternoon, Garno Tika and the team have widened the cradle enough to accommodate the generator and its frame. Just keep going, mate. The operation's also being supervised by Joachim Gusto from the generator's manufacturer. He has to make sure Garno and the team deliver the generator to the power station in perfect condition. Right, Lee, take it up to 320, please. Up to 320 ton. But just as the generator's about to get clear of the matting it was resting on, there's a snag. Stop. One of the straps that was securing it in place is still attached. OK, Lee, up on your hind, up on your line. Keep hoisting, pal, keep hoisting. With the 315-tonne gas turbine free... Keep it going like that. All the members of the team are on hand to stop it spinning around. Nice and steady, come down on your line. As it drops into the frame of the cradle, there's just 30 centimetres to play with on either side. Right, I'll do that. But when it's just 10 centimetres off the bottom of the cradle, the inspector from Siemens isn't satisfied with the position of the steel plates it'll be sitting on during the road trip. What's the situation there? He wants his plate moving to here. Because the whole weight's coming down here. It's another change of plan. Garno needs to inform his boss back at base. Uh, the Siemens guy's not happy with the mat we've got uh, on the um, cross beams. It's yet another delay for Garno, and the plates must be winched wider on the cross beams. But Joachim has the authority to alter the engineering specification as he sees fit to guarantee the turbine's safe arrival, no matter how much it delays the job. He's from logistics team. Yeah. He knows his stuff. Oh. So, yeah, no, that's one. I checked already yesterday that yeah. he's in a position to change our yeah. drawings. He's, he's OK. Right. He's checked already. OK. It's almost in position. But now the padding between the gas turbine and the cradle must be inspected. You've got you've got rubber there. Yeah. Well, you just need more or? Yes. You need more rubber? Yeah. Even with 315 tonnes of weight on top, the inspector from Siemens wants more grip. So once again, the team have to alter the plan. Right. Yeah, yeah. So you, you want to rub it underneath these, yeah? Yes, 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 yes. It's better, yeah. Right. The search for perfection is delaying the team. We'll have to get extra rubber. It's nearly five o'clock, and Garno needs to call into the office again and update the engineering team on how the lift is going. Ah, uh, been experienced, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, OK. I've got an, an hour left. With the safety of a £40 million generator at stake, Inspector Joachim Gusto won't sign off the setup unless he's 100% satisfied it's safe for road transport.
What's he think is uh, Ishii? I don't know yet. No, all oh, right. But he's thinking long enough. Oh, uh, yeah. Garno needs an answer. So are we all right to carry on then? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> but as the gas turbines lowered into position, the padding is still not yeah, right. I think we have too much wood. On where? In this side. Joaquin takes matters into his own hands. All that rubber was all across there. <laughs> With Siemens representative in Kings Lynn now satisfied, at 20 to 6, the gas turbine can be lowered the last few centimetres. Right, Lee, just lose all the weight, mate. Lose all the weight. Bring it down to zero and see how it lies. Finally, at 6 o'clock, only three hours behind their planned schedule, the generator is in the transport cradle. Is he happy? Yeah. Okay. It's been a test of all the team's engineering skills, but the generator is now ready for road transit. We've had a few alterations, but she's landing now, and uh, been a busy day, but you know, job done now, so yeah, ready to go now. With the last lashings in place between the generator and the trailer, the slings attached to the crane hook can finally be removed. It's half past six at night, but nestled between two modular trailers, the gas turbine is safe in its cradle, ready to be taken four miles to the power station. Despite the delays, on its way, within the time frame. Cheers, mate. See ya. Have a good one. The generator will be installed in a brand new facility, ready by 2019, to provide electricity to up to 370,000 households, nearly all the homes in Norfolk. Shoreham Port, on the south coast of England, near Brighton. The bulk cargo ship the Camellia is berthed, and quayside supervisor Robin Merry must get her loaded with 2,000 tonnes of wood chip biomass fuel for a power station in Sweden. We're looking for 2,000 tonnes on this ship, so a good 23-hour uh, production, I'd say, that'd take us to get it done. To get 2,000 tonnes on board in 24 hours, Robin needs Shoreham's 181-tonne mobile crane, fitted with a three-tonne orange peel grab. It's like, like the Death Star above us, basically, a huge grab. Puts in large amounts of the, the commodity without spilling is the main thing about this. But 2,000 tonnes of wood chips will only fit in the hold if they're compacted by a machine called a telehandler. These are powerful machines. They push hard and they, they flatten the cargo out for us using the bucket. And then we use the tars which have been adapted. They're not air tars anymore, they're filled with a gel. So they add a little bit more weight to the cargo and it means you can, you can flatten it out as you go. So one, car, one telly around will be at the front using this bucket, the second telly around will be behind it using the wheels to flatten it down again. But before the biomass is craned in, the telly handler has to be lifted into the hold to start flattening the wood chips layer by layer. But biomass sawdust can be dangerous. Fine particles in the air can cause irritation and need to be carefully controlled. We have to be a little bit careful of the dust, so we will should be using water suppression systems to keep the dust down. We can't afford to let any of this get into the open air. We've got too many local residents and too many people in this area. And the dust is not just a threat to people. As the biomass begins to get loaded, Crane driver Ken Feeney's worried about his engine. The main problem with this cargo, if I'm honest, is it's a machine killer. Um, it's very, very dusty, hence the reason for all the water sprays, but it still gets into all the radiators of the machines, crane will start to overheat. Um, it may be called biomass, but it's, uh, it's not machine friendly, let's put it that way. With the dust in control for now, Ken can begin loading the biomass for the handlers in the hold. Each orange peel grab contains 10 cubic metres, 
around eight tonnes of biomass. It's designed to dig in to the material, it makes a seal. And then, as long as you don't have too much on top that can spill over or blow out if it's a windy day, um, you know you're not going to lose any on the way into the boat. Down in the hold, telehandler operator Mark Henderson is spreading and compacting the biomass into every corner and directing Ken in the crane. Uh, straight down there, Ken. The team are under pressure to get 1,000 tonnes on board in the first 12 hours. Well, I don't do it very level. You'll end up having potholes, and when you drive into them, it hurts like hell. You sort of fall into them, smash the telehandler into the side, damage the telehandler, smash glass. It's been done before, it can always be done again. Once you try and avoid it. After 12 hours, a thousand tons is on board safely and the Camellia is on her way to a full 2,000 tonne load. Fantastic today. We're about halfway through the operation. We have 1,000 tonnes on the ship now. You know, it looks like we're going to hit our targets. The ship's going to make it on time. You know, everything's going really well. It's been a terrific day. The following day, the Camellia is fully loaded on time and can set sail for Sodatage, where the recycled wood from Britain will be providing electricity for the people of Sweden. Kirkwall on the Orkney Islands, northeast Scotland. A vital port for a group of islands with a population of 21,000. Farmer Keith Yunson is selling 15 one year old steers and heifers. In just over an hour, all 15 are sold. Bought by farmers who fatten them up for market on the Scottish mainland. The cattle will leave tonight on a freight ferry called the Hildesay, travelling in specially designed containers for the export of live animals. Lorry driver Colin Scott must get the cattle Keith sold to the port. In all, he needs to get 668 steers and heifers to the quayside to be loaded onto the Hildesay before she sets sail at 8 p.m. It's a long day for the cattle. The first ones we picked up this morning is 5 o'clock in the morning, you know, so yeah. not a long day standing about in the wind and rain and whatnot. Dockside, the port has an area known as a lairage, where the cattle can rest up before the sea crossing to Aberdeen. That's 13 arrived, so we've only got another 600 and something to go now. <laughs> It's a labour of love for Colin, despite his conflicting emotions. I'm an animal lover for sure, yeah. And I'll go out my way to help animals and look after them and I don't want to hurt them. But they're just so damn tasty, you know. <laughs> steak is my favourite meal of the day, steak and chips, you can't beat it. Each livestock container is supplied with bedding, food and water for the journey, with room for 20 cattle. 36 12-metre-long transporters must be loaded on board the Hildesay ferry and be ready for an 8 o'clock departure to Aberdeen. It's a treacherous sea route between Orkney and the Scottish mainland. In winter, high winds can create huge swells and tough sailing conditions for the cattle. Chief Officer Marius Evich is under pressure to get the containers on board and transport the cattle safely so they arrive in Aberdeen fit and healthy. The sailing time for today will be uh, 20, 20 hundred, eight o'clock. So I hope for that time we'll be ready to sail. Okay, we'll be, we'll be on board. <laughs> Maneuvered into position by Orcanian Ian Spence and his four-wheel drive 280 horsepower tractor. Today we are loading a livestock container onto the hill to say. This one has cattle and they're going to Aberdeen. Marius must make sure the cattle will be safe and secure for the seven hour crossing to Aberdeen. This one is the latching system for the trailer. 
strict guidelines insist the animals are regularly checked and have fresh food and water. Fresh water system, which one connect to the first trailer, and after that, one by one, all trailers connected to the fresh water. With two hours to go ahead of sailing, the last of the transporters gets on board. Finished for the day. Happy man. Loading is completed. Ready for sailing. All 668 cattle are on board with hay bedding, food and fresh water. Heading for Aberdeen. The weather forecast is for a calm overnight crossing. No reported traffic this time. You'll go be. No reported traffic. Thank you. The journey from Kirkwall to the mainland is 150 miles and takes seven hours. Forward all lines on board, very good. At half past five in the morning, they make it to Aberdeen on the Scottish mainland. All 36 livestock containers, known as LCs, can be offloaded. One by one, all LCs will be transferred to the yard. Thanks to the work of the animal transporters, the farmers of Orkney can continue their long tradition of rearing cattle for the mainland, and the ferries can continue to be a lifeline for the economy of the islands. <laughs>